If you ever lost sight of the goal in something you're doing? Um, it's easy to do when uh, r you get into a routine, right? It's easy to just kind of fulfill the routine and forget the, the goal of why you're, you're doing something. Uh, my youngest son was a bit of a, um, I guess he was a uh, very intense young child, and he uh, complained a lot and w kind of whined a lot, and there was always things that, that bothered him, and he didn't always know why, so we... we and like many kids, he had to eat his meal. He always had to finish his meal, and we sat it there, and he stayed at the table and couldn't eat. And so he's probably four years old or something, and, you know, we're, we've all left the table, cleaned up the dishes, and, and you've got to finish your meal, Caleb, and sitting there. So he's laboring over it, and he's looking at it, trying to, to finish it, and he says, are we having dessert? <laughs> and I said, no, we're, we're, we're not having dessert tonight. There's, you know, there's nothing. And he said, well, why am I even eating this then? <laughs> his goal was dessert. And he, his mind was on the goal. And he thought somehow his parents had lost sight of the goal of eating the meal <laughs> is dessert. Well, we, we have to remind our kids the goal of brushing their teeth is not to create a foam in their mouth. It's to get their teeth clean. As seminary students, you have to remember that the goal of seminary is not turning in papers, as essential as that is, professors. But the goal is to be equipped for ministry. And you can't lose sight of that goal even in the routine task of turning in papers and assignments, etc. Look, as Christians, we can easily lose sight of the goal of what we're doing, and we need to be reminded uh, of that goal. Even whole churches can lose sight of their goal, of what the Lord has them for. Pastors certainly can lose sight of the goal because of the multitude of activities that we have to engage in on a regular basis, whether it's preparing for teaching, counseling, uh, mission trips coming up, the administration of the church. We can get our head down in so many ways that we uh, get so involved in the activities that we lose sight of the goal. So I want to go to the Word of God this morning where we are told and reminded of the goal itself. And I, we could probably go lots of places to say what is the goal of the pastoral ministry, what's the goal of our teaching and our, our role in the church. I want to go to a particular place here in 1 Timothy this morning where Paul says the goal is. That's pretty clear. And we can, we can strive for what Paul says here. Um, I just want to read the, the context. You know the, the overall context of the letter to Timothy. Paul wrote to him, he says in the first verse of chapter 1 here, 1 Timothy 1, it's to Timothy, his child in the faith. And picking up at verse 3, I want to read through verse 11, and we'll zero in on the main point of this section. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, verse 3, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good, if one uses it lawfully, recognizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Well, look, all of us can easily pick out the main point in this passage. It doesn't take a great deal of exegesis and, and digging into the text. Paul just puts it right there in verse 5. Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere uh, faith. The, this is really a super statement. It extends beyond Paul's direct instruction to Timothy and extends to the church at large. This is the overall goal of our instruction. Uh, the context here, obviously, as we, can, as we read through that, uh, it obviously has to do with the teaching in the church, the instruction that the church gets. 
And, and Paul is, is saying what kind of teaching should be and should not be happening in the church. Well, men, I mean, this passage is directed at us. We are the ones who will be teachers, our teachers in the church. And Paul is saying, this is what teaching should look like. Here is the, the goal. The instruction, verse 5, or the commandment, or um, some translations say the charge uh, that Paul is referring to here, is simply the, the content of the, what the apostles have brought to the church. Uh, Timothy is in Ephesus. Paul himself was there three to five years prior to the writing of this letter. Uh, and Paul gave them the apostolic instruction of the gospel and the, the, all the commandments that Christ had given them. And Paul is saying the goal of those things, of the teachings that should go on in the church, is given here. Um, the goal, the aim, telos, uh, the end of the instruction that the apostles gave was love. Love. Paul's not writing a Hallmark card here, though. He doesn't have something in mind, kind of a sappy sentimentality, uh, when he says the goal of our instruction is love. I mean, some people might read that and say, oh, isn't that sweet, you know, we're to love one another, and that's what the teaching is about. Well, you men know that's, that's not what's bound up in the, this word agape uh, that Paul uses. It's a strong, it's a vigorous, sacrificial um, action that you take that, that wells up from within. Um, it's, a, it's a giving love that sacrifices oneself for uh, the good of another. I like the way Leon Morris contrasts agape, Greek word for love, with eros, another Greek word for love. Uh, eros is the, the love of the worthy, the love of the beautiful. And it's a love that desires to take for oneself that thing that is beautiful and use it for your own benefit or take it for your own benefit. Okay, that's eros. That's not the word, obviously, that Paul uses here. The word Paul uses is agape, which is uh, more contrast directly with eros, saying agape acts irrespective of the merit of the object of the love. Okay? Rather than saying, this thing is so beautiful and I love it, Agape doesn't say this thing is so ugly and so I love it. It says I don't care whether it's ugly or beautiful, I'm going to give love to it. And it acts to give love, to give what is best for the other rather than to take that thing for yourself. A complete opposite concepts of what the same word in English we use, love. Well, Jesus distilled the essence of all of God's command in just that one word. Agape. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says here, look, this is the goal. This is the end. This is what we're shooting for. This is what we're trying to accomplish in our instruction in the church is love. The kind of love that God demonstrated by sending his own son to pay the ransom price. The kind of love that requires, well, will call someone to deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow Jesus daily, regardless of what that costs. Uh, the kind of love that will, will make you, uh, as a mature Christian believer, restrict your freedoms so that you might not cause another person to stumble. That kind of self-pushing uh, uh, ourselves down kind of love and lifting up another. The kind of love that will make a, a husband swallow his pride and ask his wife, how can I be a better friend and companion to you? And then actually give himself to do that. See, Hallmark cards will make you come occasionally, how can I be a better friend to you? But true agape will make him actually give himself then to listen to what she says and do that. That's, that's the kind of love here. We're not talking about something sappy or weak. Um, we're talking about strong, determined action here. Okay, so we, we see the goal in the word that Paul uses, love. But we also see in how Paul further describes it. Look at the text. It's not just love, period, but it's, Paul wants to clarify, it's love that comes from or flows out of a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Look, men, our teaching in the church should not uh, generate love by rote, but rather by, uh, by loving actions that flow out from a heart that truly desires to, um, has been transformed by Christ. That's the goal. I mean, it's, it's love from a pure heart without mixed motives. 
Um, it's love with a good conscience. Not obeying God because you think somehow you've got to pay Him back. Or, or out of, uh, uh, you don't want it, it to be beholding to anyone and so you obey God. Not, not that kind of love. From a good conscience that sincerely just desires to obey. Love from a sincere faith that believes that Jesus Christ is the only Redeemer of the world and He has redeemed my soul. My sins were nailed on the cross just like we sang this morning and I just desire to live a life uh, that pleases Him because of that no matter what the cost. Okay, So that's the goal. That's what we're teaching for. I want you to notice it's not just based on, uh, or, or uh, the goal is not just actions that might come out of the people that you teach. It's also concerned with the inward heart motivation. It's not just love, which might be defined as action. It's really an action word, but love that flows from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. Okay, That is the goal of our instruction. Okay. There it is. That's the goal. You know, how long does seminary chapel last? You know, <laughs> that, that, that's the point. That's what Paul is saying. Now, before you get out your Greek cards and start, you know, thumbing through them, let me ask you this. How are you going to accomplish that? How are you going to teach in such a way that causes people to love freely from their heart. I mean, Paul gives us lots of instructions as pastor. We're to preach the word in season and out. We're to rebuke and exhort. We're to oversee the flock. Those are all things we do, right? But Paul here is saying, look, the goal of our ministries is to, and the effect that it has on other people. And so I ask you men, so, how are you going to do that? How are you going to accomplish that end game? How are you going to reach that goal? Um, are you going to do it by the force of your will? By how loud you talk? Are you, are you going to uh, wow and dazzle people with your amazing ability to uh, come up with a creative, alliterated outline? Is that how you're going to, to bring them to this place of love? I mean, if all else fails, are you going to pull out your master's seminary diploma and show it to them? And that, that they should be responding to Christ like they should. I mean, Paul's just saying the goal here is the effect that it is going to have in the lives of the people you teach. And that's what Paul's telling Timothy, and that's what we're hearing from the text. How are we going to accomplish that goal? Well, let me just direct you back to the text. Because Paul doesn't leave that question open. In the, in the surrounding verses around verse 5, he tells us both how that's not going to be accomplished in our teaching, and he tells us how it is going to be accomplished in our teaching. I want you to see this this morning. Obviously, the context of this whole passage is our teaching. Instruction is right there in the center of verse 5. Um, Paul had been there in Ephesus. He had given this instruction. But apparently, because of the, the, one of the reasons for this letter, there were some of the elders who he left in charge in Ephesus who were beginning to think that they had run out of things to teach. They'd, they'd run out of content, maybe, and they needed to come up with something new to teach people. They had kind of taught through everything Paul told them to teach through, and so now they were searching for other things, and apparently, from verses 3 and 4, they had begun to uh, look for other things to teach. And so here's one, one characteristic of what, not, what will not accomplish that goal, and what I would just want to call speculative Christian teaching. Okay, look at verse 3 and 4. I urged you, Timothy, on my departure, that you may remain there at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, different things, different teachings, nor to pay attention to myths, endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation. Speculative Christian teaching. Look, we don't know exactly what the content of this speculative teaching is. Uh, was that was going on here, but apparently it had something to do with um, you know the elders there beginning to do what was common in the Jewish synagogues of the day is to go back into the genealogies of the Old Testament and to uh, pull out some figure there in the genealogies and spin up some story about something God had done for them in order to bolster some moral lesson that they were trying to teach or some teaching that they wanted uh, to you know support. 
And, I mean, you know, like Nashon, you know, the, the great, great, great grandfather of David. I mean, you've heard how, how, what, what God taught him through his, uh, what he taught to his grandchildren, haven't you? No, you haven't. Because the scripture doesn't tell us that. But that's the kind of thing. He was there and, and, and crafting up this speculative Christian teaching that really just came out of the mind of the teacher and yet they were, they were calling it Christian teaching because it was going on in the, the church. And in verse 4, Paul says very clearly, um, this kind of teaching only gives rise to speculation. It doesn't further the work of God. It doesn't further the administration, which is by faith. It doesn't call people to the kind of lives that God is calling them to. It doesn't call them to the goal of love. It's just a distraction. Okay. So that rather than focusing believers on the, the goal of living out a life of love, it just fills their mind with trivial things. Well, look, I, I don't know of anyone today that's teaching uh, speculative teaching based on Old Testament genealogies or myths that have kind of come up in the Jewish uh, stream of history. Um, but we certainly do have some teachings in the church today that are distracting, that are fit this characteristic of speculative Christian teachings. Um, I mean, look, you've got people making visions and prophecies and saying they have a word from the Lord and then saying whatever it is they want to say. They have received something. That's just speculative Christian teaching. And listen, men, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, I'm in Tulsa. I'm in like the religious wacko Mecca. And so we get this all the time. But it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, you are going to have people in your church who are going to be influenced by this sort of speculative Christian teaching. And you need to be prepared to not only not allow it in your church, but you need to be prepared to cut it off when you do begin to see it in your people. And look, you've got other things too, like these heaven encounters. Um, I mean, I don't know what happened to Todd Burpo's little son, um, but you know this, this book about his field trip to heaven and all he saw and all the Bible studies that have been spawned off of that. Um, you know, Don Piper's 90 Minutes in Heaven. Bill Weiss wrote a book, 23 Minutes in Hell. I mean, all of these sort of encounters with the supernatural, this is just speculative Christian teaching doesn't have a place in the church. Um, another category really is, is just kind of untethered allegorizing that some Christian teachers will do. I mean, we saw it you know, in past years in books like The Shack, uh, Blue Like Jazz. Uh, they're, they're promoting a certain brand of Christian teaching just kind of by allegorizing the things that they find in Scripture. Um, it may sound provocative. It may sound interesting. Um, but the content itself is not in the Scripture. It's just been spun up in the mind of some person. Look, man, not only are you, are you be not allow someone else to teach that in the church, but even yourself, as you begin to think, hmm, what, what, what can I teach that would be interesting? First off, time out at that point. Don't even go there. But sometimes you're tempted, you want to, your people to be engaged and to, to, to grow. Don't start spinning up things in your own mind either. I know there's some, some way related to the scripture, but we need to stick close to the scripture uh, themselves. Sometimes we even see this kind of speculative Christian teaching in the form of really sloppy songwriting that's foist on the Christian community. You ought to evaluate some of the Christian music for content and theology. Man, a lot of our people are regularly taking in nothing more than speculative Christian teaching uh, kind of put out there in the form of art. If it squares with the Scripture, great. If it doesn't, it just is what Paul says. This, uh, you need to teach, instruct certain men not to be teaching these things. Okay. We just need to be aware of distracting speculations. They have no place in the teaching of the church, and frankly, they have no place not only just not from your pulpit, but they're to have no place in the lives of the people that are in your church. And so you, as the pastor, need to warn them against these kinds of things. We, we, need, to, we need to be willing to name names, to help people. I mean, if you know, I heard Jack Hughes say one time, if you know there is a landmine in the parking lot of the church, and when people walk out of your uh, a service, they might hit it, then don't just say, there might be landmines out there somewhere. Be careful. If you know where it is, you better point it out. And you better let them know to avoid that particular spot. Okay? 
So there's one thing that is not going to further the administration, not going to reach the goal of love. There's a second thing as well. Besides speculative Christian teaching, there's also unbiblical Bible teaching. And I know, I didn't, you know, what? Yes, unbiblical Bible teaching teaching because sometimes in the name of Bible teaching and with with the Bible in their hand people can be giving out a lot of Christian instruction which is does not is not truly biblical let let, let me explain what I mean let me let Paul explain what I mean for some men verse 6 straying from these things context what's these things the instruction our instruction that what the apostles have delivered to you okay some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion wanting to be teachers of the law even though they don't understand what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions they were teaching the bible itself there in ephesus in this case, the Old Testament law. But Paul says, man, these guys don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah, they're, they're, they're speaking the words of the Scripture, but they're not speaking them correctly. They're not applying them correctly. They're not giving the appropriate interpretation based on where we stand. They're missing the big picture, the point, the, 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 the real proper application, of the fact that the law is no longer the governing uh, uh, mediator for the relationship of, between God and His people. I mean, Galatians just says over and over again, the law has been replaced by grace and faith. It's not the old covenant we're in, it's the new covenant. And so by going back to the old covenant, they were uh, teaching the Bible, the Scriptures, but in a, Paul says, unlawful way. Verse 8, look at it. We know that the law is good, okay, I'm not deprecating the Old Testament law in and of itself, It has its purpose. It has served its purpose. It still has some good for Christians if one uses it lawfully, appropriately, the way it should be used. If we understand its proper use and application, the law is fine. You need to teach the law. But teach it lawfully. Teach it appropriately. It does expose to us God's holiness, His standards. But in reality... I mean, Paul says in verse 9, look, the law is not for righteous persons. It was never intended for righteous persons. It was intended to curb unrighteousness. So what does it have to do with the administration of grace and faith under the new covenant? It's not intended for that purpose. It doesn't function to help us with our goal of a walk of love. And and these teachers there were were trying to get folks to return to law-keeping as the means of working out their sanctification. And Paul basically just needed to say, hey, listen, I wrote a letter to the Galatians. Why don't you guys read that? Because Paul clarifies the issue there. Unbiblical Bible teachers. Again, distracting, verse 6. Fruitless discussion is what comes out of it. And therefore, they need to be silenced. Okay, so... I, don't, I, don't, I haven't met a Judaizer yet in my ministry. I haven't, I haven't found one. But we do have a, a, all sorts of, uh, quite a variety of unbiblical Bible teachers that are out there in the, that are teaching the Bible. You know, you have, you have prophecy buffs who devote entire programs and entire books uh, to identifying the red horse of the apocalypse or who is the shaggy goat. Um, that we have deliverance ministries, right? Again, come to Tulsa. You'll, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll encounter all of this. Um, you know, special procedures for d- delivering you from anything, from demonic possession to, you know, generational curses that might be on you. Well, they're taking things from the Scripture and they're just distorting them into unbiblical Bible teaching. Okay? We, we have those who maybe with good intentions, but they're championing one strand of Bible teaching and holding it up higher than others. I mean, things that that we've had to deal with are health, wealth, teachers. Look, there are great promises in the Scripture that God will heal our diseases and afflictions, but that's 
at the coming of the Messiah, just like when the Messiah was here, he did those same things. That's for then. We need to put it in its appropriate context. But the health wealth teachers, I mean, that's not their only problem, but they're taking the scriptures and just extracting one piece of scripture and putting it above all others. They're, they're unbiblical Bible teachers. There are some, I think, with good motives. They're, they're advocating a, a family church type structure for every church and saying it's not a problem with having a family church type structure, but saying that's the only biblical option. That's the only way. Well, look, that's all they're doing. They're, they're, they're championing one particular strand or one something they find in the scripture above and beyond everything else. It can be distracting to the administration of love. Have you, have you run across those who use the Bible to teach a kind of hyper-patriotism to America? I mean, there are whole streams of, of teaching out there along these lines and people that are gathering up into these churches and they get excited and that becomes their whole thing. And we would just say, man, that just fits exactly what Paul's talking about. Fruitless discussion. They don't know what they're talking about. They're taking the Scripture and trying to use them basically to prove their own point. Probably the most destructive that we'll all see, because it's so common and it's so pervasive as it was in Paul's day, is that those who um, are trying to use the Scripture to justify living by law rather than living by grace. Okay? Um, by law and list. Look, faith will show itself in works. And so we do uh, promote and encourage a, a working out of our faith in good works. But as, as those who stand in the pulpit and pound home works, do this, change your life in this way, all we're doing is creating in our people's minds a list. Here, If I follow this list, I've got the Christian life down. And so it, when, if we unintentionally promote lists without love or, or uh, following the law or effort alone without grace and faith that, that motivates that, man, we, we could possibly be in this category. Not appropriately teaching the Scriptures according to our instruction that was left for us. Th these kinds of things are a distraction. And they, and they tend to supplant what Paul says at the end of verse 10 is sound teaching. They are contrary to sound teaching. When Paul says sound teaching there, he's referring to healthy teaching, that which produces health, that which accomplishes the goal. Health like, not like take your medicine and solve a problem, but health like good food. This will, will build you up. Three times in 1 Timothy, he uses this very phrase. Healthy teaching. Sound teaching. Look at chapter 4, verse 6. He says it again to Timothy. In pointing out these things to the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. You'll be doing your job. Constantly nourished okay, on the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Look. Paul says, look, clear the pantry shelves of all the junk food that's been taught in Ephesus, and instead you need to be making sure that the people there are being nourished on sound doctrine, healthy teaching. Okay, He says it again in chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness... Look, he's conceited. He understands nothing. I mean, Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Uh, Paul, interestingly, here in verse, in chapter 6, verse 3, Paul kind of brings it all together and says, okay, what does sound, healthy teaching look like then that will accomplish our goal? He referenced it back in uh, chapter 1, verse 10, this sound teaching, but he didn't give a whole lot of criteria of what it's like. But beginning in, here in chapter 6, verse 3, he tells us what sound teaching looks like. Look, he gives four criteria or four descriptors of this healthy uh, teaching. And it's really four criteria by which uh, I can measure my teaching in the church or any other teaching that goes on in the church. Look at it. First off, the first criteria is that it's not a different doctrine. Right? 
If anyone advocates a different doctrine, different than what? Different than the instruction that the apostles left. Okay. Back from chapter 1, verse 5, our instruction. So it's not a different doctrine. Second criteria, it is, Paul says, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. The, the sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul just gives a special criteria to those things which Jesus spoke. The words themselves as recorded in the, the gospel record. Okay. A third criteria, what would characterize sound words, sound teaching. Um, there at the end of verse 3. And those, the, those that doctrines that conform to godliness or that are according to godliness. Those that produce godliness. They fall in line with and promote a walk of love. Godly actions. When you hear godliness, don't just think righteous things. Those are godly actions. So Paul's saying teaching doctrines that conform with or, or promote or lead to godly actions, which... We've seen from the goal, that's a walk of love, the greatest commandment. Well, there's a, there's a fourth criteria here to turn back to chapter 1, verse 11, where Paul uh, uses this term, sound teaching, for the first time here. Not only is it to be not a different doctrine, or the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the second criteria of what would be sound teaching, or third, teachings that are according to godliness, but also in verse 11, still, at the end of verse 10, picking up sound teaching, which is according to the glorious gospel. Teachings that flow naturally out of the gospel message itself. Those are four criteria. It's the instructions that the apostles have left us, as recorded in the pages of Scripture, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, those that promote godliness, even if it's not directly from the Scripture, those things that practically are going to promote the things that the Scripture does call for, that would be sound teaching, as well as things that are according to or in line with, that flow out of the very gospel truths themselves. This all, verse 4, promotes gives rise to and furthers the administration of God, which is by faith. Look, man, here it is. This is how you receive or achieve the goal of our instruction. You let the content of your instruction uh, fit those criteria, and the Spirit of God will then take that and use it in the lives of your people to create, to arrive at the end goal. Look, you do your part... Let your content be according to what Paul says will lead to health in the body and then you let the Spirit do the rest of the work. It is not your job to twist the arms of your people week after week telling them all of the things they should do and shouldn't do and by the coercion of your will and the power of your persona make them love. Make love flow out of their heart. You, you cannot do that. Believe me, I tried. From time to time, I get stuck in this rut and think that my job as a pastor is to get people to do something. I can't. I can't even get my own kids to do something. What causes someone, for, what causes love to flow out of their heart is a work of God's Spirit. But Paul is saying, our instruction does have an effect on that if our instruction is in line with sound teaching and like it should be and is not straying off into these distractive, distractive speculative teachings or, or unbiblical type of Bible teaching. We just stick straight with the Word and we preach it to them and we let God's Spirit do His work in them. We, what, the, what the church needs is basically the Gospel. The sum total of God's expression of His desire. We not only are brought to life by the gospel, but we live our lives on the gospel and on gospel teaching. That comes in these four sources that Paul has mentioned. Okay, look, I'm in your church, and you're teaching me week after week. And I come into your church, and I, um, I mean, I've had a rough week. My job is piling up on me. 
Uh, my kids are not obeying me. There's a frustration going on between my wife and I. Uh, I'm beginning to run behind on the bills. I'm making the same money, but inflation and whatever, I don't know. Um, I'm just basically feeling like an all-around failure. I haven't gotten enough sleep. My head hurts. And I come in and I sit down in the chair and listen to you teach. <laughs> At this point, love is not flowing out of me. I am, I'm just kind of throwing myself a pity party and I'm feeling like, uh, but here I am. And so how are you going to engender love for God and for my fellow man, my wife, my children, my co-workers, whoever I might run across, how are you going to engender that? I mean, are you going to teach me about how Achmenadad's nuclear program is the red horse of the apocalypse? Well, I hope not. That's not going to help me at all. Are you going to um, give me a procedure for deliverance from this apparent you know, bondage that I'm under? No. You also don't need to tell me how I need to try harder to fulfill the Ten Commandments. And if I would just do that, things would get better for me. No, man, what I need to do is you take me to the Scriptures and you show me the Gospel truths and how they work out and apply in my life. You need to tell me that God is holy and He is on His throne. You need to tell me that the Son of God has died for my sins and that He is the Lord and Savior and He has sent His Spirit in the world to give us strength over temptation, whatever we may face. You need to tell me that I need to cast my anxieties on Him. Not as a religious duty, but as a loving response to a Father who is ready to give me peace and help me in my situation. You need to tell me that there's a glorious future that awaits me. I've been adopted into God's family and I am secure in Christ no matter what I feel like about myself right now. See, as you begin to teach and proclaim the gospel and its practical outworkings in my life, the administration of grace by faith and how it works out, you don't do it but the Spirit will begin to build love in my heart first for God and then let it flow out to other people. Nourished by these sound words, as Paul said in 4.6, um, I'm, I'm able then not to snap at my wife or grumble at my kids or throw myself a pity party. I'm actually able to begin to give myself to love them again. Look, play that out a thousand times in a thousand different ways. This is how the Spirit works in the church. It seems so counterintuitive. But this is how the Spirit works. Because we can't change people's hearts, men. It's the Scripture that does that. It's the Gospel that does that. Look, that's why we, we, we sing Gospel songs. That's why we read Gospel Scriptures like was read this morning. That's why we proclaim gospel truths. That's why we encourage each other with gospel realities. That's why we pray gospel prayers so that we might live out gospel lives and let the Spirit do that in us. So my brothers, I mean, we're, we're just fellow soldiers in this battle. We have instructions. Here's the goal. It's a goal we in and of ourselves cannot accomplish, but we've been told how to do it. So I commend to you the goal. Don't forget the goal. Love from a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith. And I also commend to you the means, verse 11, sound teaching which is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which we have been entrusted. Let me pray for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you are glorious to us. We sang this morning how our sins have been nailed to the tree. We bear them no more. Oh, this is so well with our souls. Lord, I pray that for all of us, as we labor and we prepare for our labors that you have for us, that you would cause us not to gain a high opinion of ourselves and to think that somehow we need to come up with some teaching that will affect men in this way. But we need to be content with the teaching that you have once for all delivered to the saints. And we need to lovingly powerfully expound it to your people and let them see your glory and let them see the implications of it. I want to pray for our own lives that first and foremost we would see you as glorious. That we would 
let our hearts be filled with love for you. For out of that heart will flow a true humility, a true desire to serve others, a true ability to fulfill our calling, which you have called us to. Help us, Lord. We pray it in your Son's name for his glory in our midst. Amen.